today you know uh, as i said uh, we will talk about creativity and shekhar mentioned it that it is the need of the hour what i am going to talk today is from my experience okay i am not uh, going to talk something that i read and i am presenting here uh, of course i read lot of things related to the subject but uh, that's part of my work as well but today i am going to primarily talk from what from my heart what i understood what i feel and what i experienced so this is uh, kind of my own uh, narrative okay uh, and believe me creativity is not a myth and this is not something that only privileged one a privileged few can have if you really understand this subject you know what creativity is then i can bet or bet on this that every one of you can be creative in your own work okay so that's the belief uh, that i firmly have and i want all of you to carry that belief so starting with a simple quiz you know if you can give one or two seconds and try to think yourself what could be common between these two individuals exactest scientist of all time and a young children if you can guess what could be common in, in uh, uh, you know between them and i will flash the answer in a second but i thought you can think yourself and give a try and perhaps most of you are rightly guessed it this is creativity so a young children and and a great scientist Uh, and in fact all of us have one thing in common in our mind is the creativity we may not recognize it but if you if you know uh, or if you know how to recognize it you will be able to find it okay so so this is not something that is not common in human being so what is going to be our agenda this morning uh, so we will start you know uh, we will like brief walk through our introduction to what is creativity why it is important etc then i will go into some uh, some slides which uh, i will walk you through my industry experiences uh, why creativity was uh, so critical or so important in those things so those, those examples are all about different industrial or technological innovation that i have i had the opportunity to work on or get associated with it uh, and then towards the end of this talk we will i will try to share uh, some of the things that you should be aware about uh, that can help to invite creativity in your own work and if you hear those that by those those things you will realize that this is really not something difficult or uh, completely uh, undoable everybody can do that and time permits towards the end i will try to share you know some few current trends that i have experienced in the industry things are drastically changing over the past 5 uh, years or 7 uh, years which made me to think that i need to equip myself with more knowledge because knowledge is the power uh, we all hear that but i realize that that knowledge is the power so in the world to that we are living and the world that we will be living in the days to come this is going to be the important uh, you know the uh, determination factor or the uh, or the discrimination factor uh, so start let's start let's start with first uh, why 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 creativity is so important or why is it a buzzword today uh, from from a society perspective so i am going to talk you or walk you through that what the society thinks and what the industry thinks what the academia thinks so it's a it's a combined view uh, holistic view uh, why this is so important so to do that uh, to to help you understand why this is so important i thought it would be worth uh, to share a data point uh, and there are multiple or different different data points all would be same talking about the same story okay so it's not a uh, disjointed 
or isolated or unique story. It's all talking about the same story. Uh, here, what I'm sharing here is the Global Innovation Index, which is an index which uh, I, uh, I think uh, uh, this, it was first reported in 2007 and then uh, it, it has been reported every year. Uh, I believe the next uh, index reporting will be due next month, uh, September 2020. Uh, and this is actually a, a, a thing index uh, which is reported by jointly by uh, Cornell University, uh, United States, uh, Inseed. Inseed is a uh, business school uh, located in France, but they have uh, things in other countries as well. So Inseed is Inseed. And WIPO. WIPO means World Intellectual Property Organization. So it's a it's a arm of United Nations. So they all three work together and publish this index every year. Uh, roughly, I think around 130 countries who take part in this uh, reporting, and India is one of them. Uh, and uh, India's rank was actually 57 in 2018. And in 2019, it moved up to 52. Uh, now you might be wondering why it is so important. It is important because the global policies by the country, by the international organization, various com companies, they all set their po pro uh, you know, policies and strategies based on this index. So it's a, it's a very important index, a human development index type of index, which indicates the overall progress, uh, you know, of the society. So that's the reason very important. It helps to, you know, set, setting up strategy, measuring where we are currently in terms of current performance, and then it helps to prioritize where we should pay focus, you know. So that's the reason it is so important. And Niti <coughs> Aayog, this is a body in government of India. Is a, uh, this is a body who, who is responsible for setting the policy and direction in our own country. Uh, so they basically, uh, you know, uh, nurture these numbers, this data, and they kind of set the direction where we should all be headed as a country. Uh, so one of the major focus of Niti Aayog is innovation and entrepreneurship. So innovation and entrepreneurship has been, uh, you know, uh, listed as one of the key uh, steps, building blocks for overall development and prosperity of our uh, nation. So that's the reason it is so important. And you might be seeing that uh, uh, so many government agencies, private agencies, corporate bodies, they are all working together towards that. Uh, it's a kind of a huge uh, thing. And I will try to come touch upon that later on in this talk. So bottom line is our, crux, our uh, core crux of it is that this creativity you know, is a key or core component of this innovation, okay? And uh, it's, it's a kind of thing which is very important to the society and even the individual organizations uh, who, who are engaged in the creative process or innovation process and the individuals who are also associated with it, okay? Now, so it is not a something that is limited or restricted to, you know, art or uh, literature. It's not a, just a uh, matter of them, uh, literature or, or artist uh, domain. It is required in every area. It is required in product design, it is required in research, it is required in manufacturing, software development, everywhere. You name everywhere, everything, anything, it is required. So that's the reason it is so powerful. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, what I thought, I wanted to quickly take you through the innovation journey. Actually, this is our civilization journey as well. And so one of the way we me we measure the progress in, in the path of our civilization is uh, uh, how what kind of innovation milestones that we came across. So this is the thing I try to capture from uh, 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 Encyclopedia Britannica. Uh, it starts from time in moment in memorial uh, more than three uh, three million years ago. And then it has been reported, uh, or I took at least uh, till uh, the recent time, 1970s or so, that, uh, uh, you know, uh, so one decade ago, uh, 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 roughly, uh, uh, you know, a few years ago from us, from today. And uh, so you see here, things evolved with time. Uh, and uh, we have seen evidences of uh, 
people coming up with new tools, new techniques right from the Stone Age. Then we from the Stone Age got over. And Stone Age, you know, did not get over for want of stone. It is not that we ran out of stone and then we stopped Stone Age. We Stone Age got over because of our human creativity. The human creativity took us through the path of technology advancement and so many new things, new innovations that came in, you know, right from the discovering the fire, use of, uh, you know, uh, wind power uh, or harvesting the natural power, uh, organized farming, uh, cultivation. Uh, so earlier days, those were the things, uh, you know, great deal. Then industrial revolution came. We started building machines. We started building, uh, you know, smart machines, uh, and automation becomes a part of the game, uh, part of the everyday affairs. Uh, so, so these things continue, and it is continuing even today. Now, this is if you one thing you might be noticing that what used to be a far off affair before, you know, used to take maybe a uh, several thousand years of gap previously. Now has reduced technology evolution, you know, has the uh, gap has reduced to maybe a couple of years, maybe a, a dec just a decade. So it's a kind of, you know, one wave of uh, creativity is, uh, you know, breaking on the next wave and next wave. So it's a one, one after another wave of creativity and innovations are breaking on one another. So, so this is why I'm saying is that this is the human nature, okay? The creativity is part of the human characteristic, uh, be the homo sapiens. By nature, we are creative. We cannot take things uh, in status quo. We do question things, and we always try to be better and faster, smarter, efficient. Okay, that's our human uh, intrinsic nature. Uh, and biology also has uh, kind of uh, indicated uh, uh, through different uh, experiments and observations and data points. So this is a very, very part of our human nature and journey that we are creative. So that's the one thing I basically wanted to, you know, highlight here through this, uh, uh, through this uh, uh, slide. So having talking this technology innovation journey, etc. Then now let's see why this is uh, so important. We understand that we are doing, we are we are creative, etc. But why is this important from a society perspective? So this is what I wanted to, you know, little bit explain here. So I started with uh, you have a two views here. Uh, and a society view, which is a macro view, and it includes the people, organizations, technology, everything into it. Uh, and then there is an individual in entity, uh, a micro level, the business organization, which are actually kind of building blocks for uh, innovation, you know, uh, industrial innovation, technology innovation. And they do it for their own reason, because innovation helps them to create, come up with, uh, you know, uh, innovative products which increase their uh, sales, which increase their profit, profitability, etc. Uh, so that is what they do. But in a, in a, they do everything for the society, for the people uh, that, that live in this uh, society. So if you look at, at a macro level, uh, there are three factors to it. One is uh, organization, which are the building blocks of this, uh, of this uh, innovation. Uh, then the people or the society itself, uh, who are actually the consumer of that innovation. So they demand uh, uh, what they need and, and they actually consume the fruit of the innovation. And the other side is the technology. Uh, so technology is a kind of uh, thing which is a feasibility factor, you know, whether things will be possible or not possible, uh, whether we should be able to build it or not able to build it, technology determine that. So it's a thing that you you know help us to really to be uh, ultimately at the end of the day achieve something, realize something, create something. So this society, business, and technology they kind of interplay uh, among each other in a dynamic way. You know, sometimes uh, one factor uh, might be you know uh, uh, dominant. Uh, so for example, sometimes technology becomes very dominant, and that drives innovation. New technology coming in. Uh, like uh, it was the bronze uh, era or bronze age at one point of time. Then when people discovered um, humankind, mankind discovered uh, uh, iron, they moved from uh, to iron and still actually brought a complete, ushered a completely different way of things. 
so so that like that and we are seeing those, those things in the in the uh, in the modern days as well like the communication technologies or any technology you mean it is you know it is going in drastic uh, technology is driving a lot of innovation so sometimes you know the technology uh, plays a very role sometimes it is our society which uh, demands new things covid is a perfect example uh, so we have uh, you know gone into a different kind of challenge or era now where we need to we need different type of solution we need more uh, we need to be safe we need to remain healthy we need to continue with our day to day activities we cannot stop them uh, you know uh, we can not put them on hold we need to our education needs to go on industries need to go on business commerce everything needs to go on so so covid is you know has brought us in a situation where society is demanding uh, something innovative some innovation and we are seeing the result of that There are so many startups, so many organizations. Everybody, there is you. You name a company, you won't be surprised uh, that if you do not find, you will be surprised if you do not find that they are not doing something for COVID. So such is the power. Every company, every organization is thinking, how do I help uh, here in this pandemic and uh, solve something to you know for human uh, human kind. So so this is the important thing. Okay, that why society is so critical. for this innovation so having talked about little bit about you know uh, innovation journey etc why it is important uh, for the society i thought here uh, to little bit you know break it down or decipher it uh, obviously it is a concept uh, which is quite complex it is not as simple at all every organization or businesses are struggling uh, to deal with this so so this is very important so i thought to uh, you know uh, kind of explain this in a simplistic way that you can understand so innovation if you think you know it's basically summation of two things uh, in ideation and implementation so first thing ideation now ideation is about creating a something new some coming up with new ideas which are novel and useful by novel i mean that the idea idea is something new something unusual something original nobody did it past in the past so it's a novelty which is a critical component or uh, attribute of the ideation uh, in an innovation context and then the usefulness usefulness is about the value as the user uh, we derive from the idea or from the commodity or from the service okay so the value that we derive uh, you know it uh, and it is kind of related to the level of our individual satisfaction uh, so these two things novelty and usefulness basically are two key attribute of ideation uh, and this ideation is one big part of the uh, the the innovation process uh, or the innovation so without a no novel idea without a useful idea uh, you know that idea is not going to fly it is going to die so so that's the first thing but having an idea just having a good idea or novel idea is not alone okay you have to implement it also uh, so a idea will not see the light of the day unless the implementation is a flawless implementation or nice way of smart way of implementation so it is and most often where organization uh, struggles or people struggle is the implementation all of us can you know get up in the morning with a beautiful idea but how much how or how many of those ideas can be translated into a uh, into a real uh, in the real life it all depends on how uh, whether or not we can implement it or how we can implement it so that's the reason bright or you know smart ideas often fail to see the light of the day okay uh, so and there are other reasons also but uh, implementation is the uh, is one of the key factors okay to uh, uh, for the innovation journey and that's the reason uh, most of the companies uh, they talk about it and creativity plays an important role there so how you can be smarter how you can be intelligent to implement an idea okay uh to map, to create the idea uh, is also equally important so this both these things together come up to the whole innovation process and as i narrated or try to explain uh, both 
uh, ideation and implementation need the you know the elements of creativity so creativity is really the secret sauce here uh, it is the creativity which will spark novel novelty in the ideas which will spark spark or bring the usefulness in the idea it is the same creativity which will help coming out with a smarter way of implementing it so you may devise a new machine you may devise a new procedure or process or tools to implement it so without creativity you know ideations and implementation cannot uh, cannot be successful so that's a very very important thing of understanding uh, about the creativity so uh, i thought since we are talking started talking about creativity it would be good kind of to have an idea about what creativity is okay or how does it look like or what it means uh, obviously uh, you know Uh, there are many different definitions of creativity uh, if you look at literature if you look at read books if you uh, look at internet uh, you look at, you listen to hear or listen to the uh, you know presentation or lecture by the uh, by the uh, you know eminent people or researchers uh, you will you many way you can hear about creativity and they all will uh, you know uh, just try to describe it in their own way because it is the subject is like that so it's not uh, uh, in a way that there can be uh, one way of uh, saying talking about it or one way of saying about it so so there are uh, you know different people and i thought that so therefore you know uh, i wanted to thought you know uh, pump some thinking here that uh, from my own way uh, an interesting way of seeing into it uh, what is creativity uh, and to me creativity is all about finding a new way uh, or looking at the same things in a different way so it everybody is looking or you are used to look in a one particular way tomorrow you come you, you wake up uh, in the morning and you start looking at a different way that's a bit of creativity and that that that's the fundamental thing you know that helps or drives things looking at it in a different way uh, there is a famous person here Uh, edward bono uh, actually he has many you know uh, identity uh, he is a physician uh, or doctor he is a psychologist he is an author uh, but uh, why i got inter- interested about him is that uh, he has uh, he has a lot of his thoughts which he penned down in, in the books in terms of thinking how we should think how we should uh, you know what uh, helps or trigger the thought process or thinking process so uh, i believe he is the person who coined the term terms like lateral thinking parallel thinking uh, i believe uh, it is edward bono uh, i am not double, i could cross check but uh, he is the uh, he is the person who coined all the terminology lateral thinking parallel thinking indicating the unusual way of thinking okay that uh, you need to think something differently and it is not impossible and that's what he believed that it is not possible and in fact he pro- he proposed or he was carrying the idea that creative uh, how to think should be taught in the school that it is a matter of uh, way or a matter of discipline that can trigger uh, a creative thinking so he has actually this book six thinking hat where he has actually give give his uh, penned all his ideas so he said uh, our brain has uh, six different hats uh, indicated through colors like blue color hat white color hat and each color indicates uh, uh, one particular type like i think blue uh, in- indicates your big picture orientation thinking or visioning big thing so so that's about blue uh, thinking something new uh, yeah, you know the is green and that's the reason greenfield word also is very similar that is something completely new doesn't uh, doesn't exist today that's something is green if you were you know talking about data information fact then it is white so he gave this kind of color uh, connotations uh, for different way of thinking but the point is that he tried to you know kind of uh, restrict or come up with uh, uh, a number which is six he said this is the six different ways of thinking and uh, and by combination of all this thinking we can uh, come up with some new ideas so that's the interesting uh, point so having gone through all this initial introductions uh, 
i thought uh, let me then start sharing some examples you know how thinking differently uh, how looking at things differently uh, helps people to be creative helps people to people to come up with a new ideas uh, innovative ideas which are novel which are useful okay so i thought let me start with uh, some example share some example and perhaps i will start sharing with uh, examples uh, which are uh, which are which are about the technical system or engineering systems okay uh, because i had a chance to work long time in the ge global research center uh, so i have seen i have opportunity to work in you know, a long time in this developing complex uh, engineering system uh, like a locomotive like a, like the catheter tube for ct machine uh, things like uh, you know uh, uh, many other things like appliances etc i'm not going to list it down but uh, so i have ability i had a, a opportunity to see the, the, the engineering systems the innovation in the engineering system uh, so i wanted to start with uh, this light bulb okay which was the kind of iconic product uh, for ge lighting at one point of time uh, and you might be uh, wondering and i'm sure you 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 perhaps you know this picture who is who this gentleman is is none other than thomas alfa edison he is one of the most prolific inventor uh, of all time uh, and uh, he is actually a, is is uh, regarded in united states and not only in united states even in the across the globe very highly for his uh, innovative and creative ideas so he was and, and another thing he was, he was not just an inventor he was a businessman so so he actually uh, he, he was the first person the who came up with an who established an industrial laboratory and i had an opportunity to visit that laboratory and see it very closely in new jersey so if you go there is later on uh, in your life and uh, you make 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 it a point to go and visit that place and see how uh, how he built an uh, and that age you know uh, so many years ago 100 years so more than 100 years ago an industrial uh, research laboratory which was built on uh, scientific uh, you know experimentation so that was his uh, uh, his thing that uh, and in this light bulb example you should take he was not the first person who tried to build the light bulb there were many people at the time many researchers were working at the time individually sometimes collaboration uh, to come up with an incandescent bulb or like electric bulb you know uh, so uh, and uh, so thomas and edison was one of them and uh, and then uh, but the, the beauty of that is that it is his tireless effort he kept on experimenting and experimenting never gave up with the failure so that he was kind of successful as a first person to commercially launch it patent it and then commercially launch it and today we see that light bulb is a uh, every household name Uh, we cannot and and of course we do not use the uh, incandescent bulb anymore we have uh, it has gone through its own innovation uh, we are we have far more energy efficient efficient ways of producing light uh, but we cannot forget uh, the contribution and the work because that is his penchant strong penchant for the uh, strong inclination for scientific experimentation uh, do not you know restrict uh, in one idea if it is failure uh go to the next experimentation and learn from it so that's the reason he always used to say that failure is actually not a failure those are those are the learning experiences he formed this edison electric company which later on actually became the ge that's how i uh, came to know closely about his work i have seen a lot of artifacts he used the chair he used to sit uh, the desk he used to use there were so many small small things that kept uh, you know as an art as it is the display that what other things but one thing i can tell you was there in the desk was a simple notebook so he was he used to make notes and he used to write down things very very in detail and that is i think one of the characteristics of creative people that uh, they do not let any idea to go away they always note it down so i thought to mention about it uh, so so this is the story of uh, thomas edison and uh, who who kind of created the later on uh, the edison electric company became a ge and he continued uh, through the path of innovation and i thought to touch upon six sigma here 
because uh, 20 years ago, uh, uh, you know, or 25 years, 30 years ago, it when it came into uh, into into existence. Uh, people started talking about about it. It was a big buzzword. It is no longer uh, that uh, you may not hear that much about it, uh, uh, but it was a great thing. Uh, the you, what you may my may hear in the industry or may in the in the internet or places, people may say that six sigma is just a process, a process for improvement, etc. But GE did not believe six sigma is just an improvement process. GE actually took it in a far, far, you know, higher domain. In a in a data oriented, you know, uh, uh, plane, it, it took the whole engineering effort. And I'm going to little bit explain about it. So it was not new. The Six Sigma was not new uh, or not invented by GE. Before GE, Six Sigma was used by Motorola, Allied Signal. Many companies try to use Six Sigma, but the difference is that GE, you know, try to use it to unlock their, their creativity. They try to you know, use Six Sigma is a way that brings new perspective and that too as a customer centric perspective uh, and a data oriented per perspective. So these are the main things that Six Sigma brought in. Okay, so Six Sigma basically if you look, if, if, if you ask me, uh, I will talk a little differently than uh, most of the others because I work so closely here uh, for several years. Uh, there are two things, okay? First of all, Six Sigma, as you know, Sigma is basically standard deviation in statistics, okay? So stat Six Sigma basically is, uh, stands for high accuracy. What is the accuracy level? It's the number of defects in a million opportunity. If you are given a million opportunity to make a mistake, your number of mistakes should not be more than three. 3.4 to be precise. So you can see that therefore the number of defects has to be so low. You can make mistakes only less than three in a million opportunities. Such is the result focus of the so focus of the uh, this thing. So two things were important for fixing my perspective. First is a, the end-to-end -end process view that uh, you do not look so often. What happened? You know, the engineers or designers. We just look on our our what is on our plate. We just look at okay how how I should build this functionality. How should I write this code? How I should make my Java program or Python program to run? Or uh, how I can you know just manufacture or fabricate uh, this thing? So this is how we typically we the enterprise or designers or manufacturers look at things. We just look at what is on our plate. But but Six Sigma taught us that no. You should not talk, look at this way. You should look at the customer's perspective. You need to look from the customer's perspective because customers see the whole life cycle. Customer, uh, you know, do not just buy and stop using the product. They buy it and they use it. And during the usage, they come across so many things. Uh, and also at the end of the life, when the product life is over, is it going to be junk? Is it going to be a burden on me? Am I going to incur another huge cost? Uh, you know, to trash it. So, so you need to think about all this perspective, and that's the reason you need to have the sustainable view, you know, and all this uh, uh, recyclable view, environment friendly design. All this concept came in that how you can use those techniques and technologies to make it more industry uh, environment friendly, friendly and sustainable development. The second thing about Six Sigma was uh, uh, is called uh, design optimization or so robust design. Okay. It's basically a response service uh, uh, methodology where you build a relationship between the response, which is an output variable, and the independent input variables, which are factors, design factors. So we kind of build a relationship between the design factors, which are your independent input, and the response, which is the design output. And then if you can build that relation, you can build that mathematically, that relation, then you can find a region where the output variable or the response variable will have, will be least sensitive to the design factor. What I mean is that in those region, if you operate, even a small change in the design factor. So, for example, if temperature is a is a uh, is a design factor, even a small five degree or ten degree temperature move up and down your actual uh, output. For example, the focal length, like. Temperature is a very important critical thing, you know, is in designing the catheter tube. 
uh, for city machines. So those temperature, uh, you know, era things can change your focal length, the accuracy of the focal length. So if you can find out the region where a change in temperature will not affect the change in the focal length, that is the kind of zone you should operate and that's the robust design. That you found a region of operate, operation where temperature change is not going to significantly cause your uh, performance or degrade your performance. So Six Sigma actually was, you know, uh, used in that way uh, very heavily. Uh, and uh, another quick example perhaps I will touch is, uh, this is uh, design of designing of a locomotive. Uh, so why I'm saying is it is interesting. So this is the time uh, when we were designing a new look, trying to look, design a new locomotive, which can pull heavy load, so high tractive power, ability to put high load. Uh, at the same time, it will be high fuel efficient, lower emission because environmental standards were coming in. We cannot afford to have so much of emission. Uh, higher reliability, we cannot have parts replacement often. So, so you see the challenge here, okay? That we are trying to increase the effort, tractive effort, but we cannot effort, afford to increase the cost or incur higher cost due to con higher consumption of fuel, okay? So we have to have a fuel efficient, okay? We cannot, if you try to burn more fuel, you generate emission. So you cannot, uh, afford to have more emission. So you want to increase your tractive effort, but you cannot afford to have more emission. You cannot afford to have more consume, consume more fuel, okay, in, in that proportion. So you see the con, con, there is a conflicting or, con, uh, or, uh, con, or contradicting requirement. And this requirement is coming from whom? The market, the people, okay, the, the railroad operators, the passengers, they are the people. They say that, you know, we need all the things. Uh, now, when we, when we get this requirement from the market, from the people, we have no idea whether we should be able to, you know, meet those requirements or not. So what happens, what we did is that, you know, uh, we thought that we cannot solve this problem uh, uh, unless we break it down into smaller problems. So that's the reason the system level, subsystem level modeling concept we came in and that is the first time we did it for a, a locomotive. Uh, the entire, uh, we did a system modeling, system and subsystem uh, modeling for the entire locomotive uh, and, uh, and, and in a numerical way so that we know that uh, you change something where the, how the other subsystems are, uh, you know, going to play. So for example, uh, you know, uh, you, you might be thinking that, okay, I would increase uh, 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 my, uh, the frequency of my, uh, uh, you know, uh, Certain, certain subsystems, okay? Uh, that may lead to some other in, in, inadvertent effort, okay? So this is actually a, you know, a very, uh, another great example, uh, and we can talk, keep on talking, go on talking and talking, because it gave rise to more, so many creative thinking, so many people thought it in different, different ways to help us to achieve this. Uh, and most important thing I would, I would like to mention that it helped us to collaborate across different businesses or different uh, engineering units. For example, this, this traction motors required uh, gears. Those who are engineers or have engineering ideas, they may realize like the gears actually transfer torque or motion from one shaft to another shaft. And this is very high power torque, okay? So we saw, and then similar gears we found is used in the wind energy or wind farms because they are also, they have a very huge torque, a high torque. So we could leverage the technology from one place into another place so that we are not completely reinventing the wheel. Uh, I, one good idea is utilizing it another place as well. So having said that, you uh, know, technical uh, innovations or technology intensive systems, let me quickly go to a, switch my gear and talk about something more less technology and more uh, towards the, uh, you know, human feelings or human emotion. Uh, and this is my examples. I'm talking from Johnson & Johnson, where I worked uh, for a long period of time in their technology divisions, uh, technology organizations. Uh, and this bandage is one example what I thought uh, because it attracted me. Uh, the picture that you uh, see here is a gentleman by name Arl Dixon. He is the person who uh, invented this bandage. All of us, you are familiar with bandage. I don't think I have to explain what it is. But you know how he, he came up with? A brilliant idea. He was an engineer working in Johnson Johnson factory. At that time, Johnson and Johnson was 
producing sterile you know uh, gauze the gauze is the, the medical thing then there the cotton made out of cotton or uh, uh, clothes uh, or cotton lump of cotton that we use you know to produce the gauze and we apply on the wound uh, to heal the wound so johnson and johnson was famous at that time to produce the sterile gauze in, in an industrial way so that it can be shipped to for a far off distances so this gentleman had a, in another problem at his house so he was a young engineer uh, he was working in johnson and johnson and his problem at his house is that he got recently married and his wife uh, she was also young and not used to the household work so while cutting vegetables and fruits his wife often uh, the lady used to cut her finger okay so so that was and and that was a, a you know a lot of emotional uh, situation uh, if you have cut your finger and it is bleeding uh, something not to be good about it so this person he did not take this as a stress okay he thought that is an opportunity and how he changed it he came up with this concept of bandaid where he took you know a strip of adhesive uh, surgical tape uh, surgical tape is basically the tape that you put on around the wound which has some adhesion into it uh, gums into it and in that tape in the middle of the tape he put some nicely square shape or rectangle shape of small strip of gauge a gauge he put put in, 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 in into it okay and then he beautifully lined it with uh, another type of cloth or cremolin etc so basically you came up with a small piece of cloth adhesive cloth which is a gauge in in in, in it and you can just put on the top of the wound and it stays there he tried to do it earlier with you know wrapping up with sticker and this thing and it was not staying but this way he could stick it very nicely and you can still continue to do your work, regular work uh, and but you keep your wound you know uh, uh, safe you do not hurt it again and again so this is become a, such a huge you know uh, Game changer at the time, and today they said that uh, the amount of bandit change uh, produced, it can wrap the entire universe, uh, the uh, sorry, the world, 375 times. So such is the length. Okay, uh, so you can imagine. Uh, so, so what I'm trying to say is that uh, I may skip this. I may talk about this. Yeah, talk on this. Uh, so what i'm trying to say that the technology innovations uh, or the innovations or creativity always did not come in the form of uh, uh, you know complex technology a complex engineering system it can be a simple thing simple customer centric or in, in you know a user centric view where your emotion uh, is important how you put yourself in the shoe of the users or your consumers or customers is uh, plays a very important role and uh, so these are the some of the consumer product uh, these are very famous and johnson johnson product that listerine we use for mouth washing uh, the blood sugar monitoring one touch machine which we use for blood sugar monitoring avino shampoos and microgena uh, so there are so named the two names are so many products are there okay now these are global products okay these are products are have almost the same formula and almost produced in the similar plant or uh, or factories okay but they are used in different different countries and uh, and there we see the challenge you know uh, the challenge or the opportunity i would say that how the emotion uh, of the people the consumer plays differently in the different regions so just to give given one example okay that uh, this is and this happened for the asia pacific region uh, in an asia pacific region we uh, people are uh, uh family oriented compared to the westerners i am not saying that western people are not family oriented they are too but in asia pacific we are different uh, we have very soft corner to our family so in the many developing countries uh, people leave their uh, home they go and take job in a different cities different places or sometimes different countries and stay away from the their parents their loved ones so but they carry Uh, that emotion in, inside in, in their heart so they sometimes suffer from a sense of guilt okay that i am not able to do things from my home from my family from my parents you know from my elderly in the house so so in some of the countries we therefore came up with a good ideas okay some nice ideas 
where we do not sell this product as just a commodity we sell it with as a value the value which helps the individual to connect with his family even he or she is remote and it was very very successful it is very well accepted so sometimes you need to think that human centered way you know that what is really the person is suffering what is his or her pain and if you can address that pain you know in a in a way uh, that helps that individual then you are going to be successful uh, so we, i'll come up a little bit more on that uh, later on uh, but uh, this is one thing you know so this cultural difference uh, situational difference makes a lot of things uh, so has as i talk spoke so much of uh, examples i thought uh, let's talk about few things about how we can be more creative or more innovative okay uh, so i thought to first list out uh, some of the opportunities that can be used as a creative opportunity okay and this these things are given by peter drucker uh, in his book called innovation and entrepreneurship there's a book famous book you can read it and peter drucker himself is a famous person he is a kind of a uh, modern business management guru he came up with this modern business management concept where he said that business should be run uh, through, a, uh, through a streamlined processes and things like that um, and uh, so management concept is management science is is a strong believer in that and he's strong believer of innovation as well so all these opportunities that he has uh, uh, that are listed here and he has also advocated uh, like unexpected occurrences in congruities in the in the company or in the organization process need okay some process is not working so you need a new process industry and market change we know that con constantly industry and market is changing demographics are, are changing okay uh, people move from one place to another place uh, change in the perception what people used to believe, believe 20 years or 25 years ago even our own life what we used to believe in childhood we do not necessarily believe the same thing uh new knowledge uh, and new knowledge means new technology as well okay so things are and the changes are bombarding us you uh, know every now and then uh, so his point was that do not look this changes as an obstacle okay uh, or as an impediment that can uh, derail you rather uh, in, uh, you know this adversaries or changes can be looked into as an opportunity so this is very appropriate what i feel today as well in a covid situation if you think covid is a disruptor it has disrupted our normal life and therefore we are all crippled we cannot do what i would what we used to do or what we love to do earlier uh, that would not be the right way of thinking think this is an opportunity we do have some challenges but how we use this challenge or opportunity to you know come up with new ideas so that our life is actually better even with pandemic even after the pandemic is over we still can be better so i think this peter drucker's uh, uh, you know uh, thing lessons are very very important for today as well think about your adversaries as your opportunity not as your obstacle so uh, so coming to creativity you know uh, then what is really creativity uh, from a scientific perspective uh there is no one answer as i tried to mention the science is still evolving people are still go research is still going on uh, there are multiple branches of science like psychology neuroscience cognitive science design design creativity uh, all are trying to you know understand this and decipher in their own way okay uh, <clears throat> however in all this work research there are few things i wanted to highlight here that has been found and very common okay that uh, uh, and that can help us perhaps to be more creative the first thing is that this the creative people you know they are good in connecting the dots so they may be having seen things a lot of things but the creative people see those things differently and when the need arises they are able to you know connect those dots and connect collect those ideas and experiences and utilize utilize it so we it has been research uh, through the empirical study empirical research it has been found habits like writing down uh, you know ideas trying out every time you try to do try to do it differently you you go for bicycle ride 
you know take a different uh, path different route to reach the place so uh, you watch people who are creative so sometimes watching the people uh, who are creative we know that they are creative people also trigger some creative creative thoughts in your mind so we have seen uh, such habits some practice some traits these practices you know if you do regularly uh, uh, you know if you challenge yourself push yourself out of your comfort zone and try to learn new things and learn you know unfamiliar things unfamiliar subjects you by nature you increase your creativity uh, that is an observed and then our brain as i said you know it's a amazing organ, organ still not fully understood and uh, and scientists say that there are 86 billion neuron in the human brain uh, milky way galaxy has i think 200 or 300 million stars so our brain is still as if is a mini galaxy 86 billion neurons and these all neurons are connected and then one thing important that science have already has found is that the connection between the neurons is very very important uh, and this is not only at the neuron level but our, at the macro level individual level that connection is very very important as i was trying to say you know the connecting the dots the creative people actually are able to do it very very nicely they can connect those past experience uh, very nicely to come up with new ideas uh one thing i felt what while would be to mention here there is a neurological phenomena called you know synesthesia synesthesia is a phenomena that apparently many creative people uh, especially people who are engaged in the field of arts and literature they have they what is synesthesia is basically that the stimuli of one sense can you know uh, arise or arouse the other kind of sense so basically it is like you are seeing a color and then you are feeling that you are able to taste the color you are not only seeing but testing it also or you see a surface and then you you feel that you are you know eating that surface or eating that uh, you know smell of the surface the look of the surface so things like that so one thing is around using or you know another so there are people like that okay they say they they see they can see things uh, uh, in a color they can hear they can hear the music out of the color so so this kind of uh, phenomenon has also been uh, observed and people are still working on that is called synesthesia and really not going to that to say that this brain is basically an amazing organ still we have to understand but if you train your brain in a way that it it is trained to look at things differently it creates actually miracles and that is what has been i think also steve job wanted to say here in his famous uh, quote uh so i wanted to touch upon an important concept called design thinking and i may run out of little bit of time uh, i will try to wrap it up in next 5 minutes if you permit me uh, so design thinking is actually a a, a new uh, process uh, sorry it's not a new process but there is a process of coming up with new ideas okay i'm really not going to explain or teach you design thinking here but i wanted to touch upon one uh, very great example uh, of design thinking that when you are do- doing th- something how uh, how uh, how you are you paying importance to the uh, to the emotion or, or the experience part of it the experience of individuals so there is a gentleman uh, called by name sambar kingdom uh, Uh, brunel so isambard kingdom brunel he is actually a uh, 18th century or 19th century for particularly he was a civil engineer uh, he would build many roads buildings uh, ships etc etc so one of the greatest example that i would like to call up is call out is that uh, he created something called uh, great western railway uh, and when he created that great western Rail- railway which is connecting the london central london to the south west part of uh, england uh, to visit the country will understand uh, the landscape etc he just didn't go and build it ordinary civil engineer okay he didn't started building laying the track building bridges and all those things no he didn't do he started with an idea okay or a dream that whoever is taking a ride on great western railway they will have a most of the most beautiful experience, journey experience they will have the feeling that they are gliding on air they're gliding on on the clouds etc etc so that's the vision he had he wanted to give them is uh, and the tra- passengers and the travelers the most beautiful 
you know, journey experience. And that is how he went ahead and built the railroad track. And if you see uh, this is that the ro- railroad, which still exists, you know, uh, the way the the slope of the, or the gradient of the railroad track were designed, the way the curvatures were designed, complete new design of the viaduct, the bridges, they're completely designed in a completely new way. And it sets set its own standards, okay? Uh, so, so this is a very important, uh, interesting and important thinking that when you design thinking, think about the experience, think about the emotion. And if you can connect to that emotion, if you can understand the person is here to uh, to, to experience uh, something and not to really use or uh, derive the uh, utility value, then you will be able to do miracle. And that is what is important. So that's the reason, you know, design creativity often or off late is a very highly research area and that's my research area too. There are different ways that designers uh, work on. Uh, they use design methodologies. There are different methodologies like uh, trigger word, brainstorming, kinetics. There are different ways, methodologies which will teach you or tell you how in, you know you can be creative. There are cognitive uh, behavioral ways, okay? Uh, so where you use analogical reasoning, like like biomimicry is one example. You you draw inspiration from the biology or the nature uh, to design something. So the, the classic example of biomimicry is uh, you know the aircraft. So long uh, long for a long period of time, human has the intention to fly like a bird, and that idea of a bird basically got translated when the aircraft was designed or airplane was designed. Uh, so that's the kind of analogy we try to see, and there are many analogous examples we see. People try to get take examples from the nature uh, to come up with a new innovative solution. Uh, so there is a famous book, you know, called Science of Artificial. I think the first edition came uh, something around 1969 or something. Okay, uh, long, long ago, we all are bored uh, by this gentleman uh, called uh, Herbert Simon. Uh, so the idea, of the, his point was that. The world that we are living in, uh, the things that are uh, surrounding us, mostly are artificial. They're all made by us, and we have made to us to suit our need to address our problem. So he was basically came up with this concept of you know uh, uh, design as a way of creative solution, uh, and, uh, solving uh, a creative problem, or design is a way of coming up with a creative solution or to the problem. So that's very important, uh, very interesting. You can read this book. And off late, we are seeing that this open innovation concept is actually triggering off or triggered off. We see that uh, uh, innovations are not confined within the uh, geographic or, or the domain of the company. It's a more of a collaborative effort. So we can talk about that sometime. And our own IIC, Indian, uh, Indian Institute of Science, I thought it will be worthwhile mentioning we have a lab called IDS Lab where I am part belong. Uh, we do work on uh, design creativity aspects, research, active research going on, uh, how to produce uh, you know, creative product, uh, creative design creative solution. Uh, maybe uh, sometimes you can visit our lab and I will be, love to uh, walk you through. In fact, we are planning to, I'm watching uh, some of you, uh, some of you to, if you can do a workshop uh, next month, uh, a hands-on workshop where we can teach Teach you, or you can experience a cre- uh, to coming up with a creative concept, and you sketch it, you craft it, you model it, or build it. So we are trying to create a you know work simple workshop around the creative design, where you will be able to sketch and build things creative creative way. Uh, and this will not be uh, you know incomplete if I don't touch upon this uh, computational creativity. Uh, this is a um, buzzword, uh, but the a new world where artificial intelligence is actively being used to spark off uh, creativity. Uh, I'll not go uh, in detail, but you must have heard about Google Brain. Uh, so Google Brain is a project where they're using artificial intelligence, of specifically the machine learning part, uh, to uh, to create a sound uh, or to create a paint or, 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 a, or a picture drawing. So, so the Magenta is one such program I think you'll find in the internet also that you can you can create a different sound. Uh, all, these are all created by the uh, machine learning. Uh, some recent trend, uh, 
uh, I will not perhaps uh, but we'll talk about it. Uh, this lean startup concept uh, is uh, is basically catching the world. And I had a opportunity last work on this uh, these things in the last uh, couple of years before I came to IRC, and that's the reason I tried. I realized that knowledge and is becoming so powerful. Okay, industry or uh, companies are not anymore um, uh, working in a way that that they used to work uh, 20 years ago. So there. Uh, that you know the silo uh, R and D are gone. So things are more open, more uh, more diverse, and more distributed. And so that's the reason the startup concept is so important. And in India also we are seeing the uh, startup concept as uh, you know uh, caught the imagination of uh, everything. Uh, today uh, in India maybe we are uh, within the top five, but we have a lot of opportunity. Honestly speaking. To go there, compared to the many other countries, uh, especially like US, if you see their output, startup output, and our output, uh, we have a lot of opportunity. But the good thing is that, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, because of government uh, uh, kind of policies, there are a lot of support, uh, there are a lot of coordinations, uh, and government agencies are helping and young startups, student startup startups. So do not uh, lose your sight out of that. Because entrepreneurship uh, is kind of in, uh, intrinsic to the individual. Okay, we have the by nature, uh, uh, you know, questioning the status quo, and uh, we have by intrinsic nature. We always try to improve things. We do not take things as it is. We always find. So that's the reason, uh, uh, you know, and startup is basically gives that way. Uh, in my, if you are it's a it's a way where you get. To experiment an idea very fast <clears throat> in a conventional way, it goes to the research and development cycle. Everything you know is up to the mark. And then you go and start building things. Everything is again built nicely, and then you go and go to the market. You wait a long cycle to see the uh, your idea idea coming, seeing the light of the day, and wait for uh, how it is working. Startup is actually cutting short everything. So you have an idea, you build it quickly. Uh, you take it to users or customers and see how uh, whether they like or do not like. If they like, good. Move or move on. Add further things, further features. If they do not like, pivot or switch. Okay, you go to take another path. So you do basically this experimentation. You go to the uh, path of experimentation or repetition, which is actually the core concept of startup. That you are uh, building fast, experimenting fast, learning fast. And then you are moving on from there. Uh, so with that, perhaps I will wrap up or stop my conversation today. And again, it's a glad for me to be here and share my experience and journey with all of you. Uh, I would like to open it up if any questions are there. I would like to glad to help, but I will give it to the organizers to decide how they want to go with. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, sir. That was a really enlightening talk. And I feel we have the time on our hands. If you are available, if you would like to take up questions, we can go ahead and do that. Yeah, I'm available. I'm perfect. I feel always, always happy to answer. <laughs> okay, so uh, I'll start off with the first question, um, which is as follows. In your fifth slide in the presentation that you have said, uh, there's there's a statement industry will demand creativity like never before. And a person has asked why now creativity is has always been an important part of the workflow. Also, are there examples where a country or society has made a systematic successful efforts to cultivate creativity? And what is the process as far as an environment goes? As in what kind of environment should be available to children when they're growing up and to young individuals in the educational system? to cultivate the very idea that people should be creative? Yeah, that's a very wonderful question. Uh, I'm not sure I will be able to answer these questions in totality or not. Uh, I think your question, crux of the question is that uh, how we can, this is, a, this is a need not only for the, for this hour, creativity is a need forever. But mm -hmm. what we can do in our uh, in our uh, education, our our uh, growing up in our system to be you know uh, to do it more easily or uh, more efficiently. Uh, 
honestly speaking i think when i grew up it was not there but when i see today my son growing up they are a lot more serious the school education the teachers are a lot different than the kind of environment i grew up so i believe things are changing okay uh, but what i feel is really need to be done is the is the uh, the mindset okay uh, i think if the parents talk about it teachers talk about it uh, rather you know uh, rather than teaching it doing it actually is more powerful and i have seen uh, you know the countries in the west Uh, especially in the US since I have, and in Singapore also I have seen uh, since I have lived lived on those countries a little bit uh, during my course of my uh, thing uh, they have those habit of you know problem solving attitude uh, so they try to inculcate that problem solving attitude and when you try to solve a problem automatically uh, you tend to be creative because you try to solve it in a different way or in a unique way so novelty comes into it automatically uh, and then if you practice other things you actually expand your horizon so so i answer your question yes uh, i think scope exists to be uh, to have it in more systematic way of being creative but at the same time i see the trend so the government is recognizing it whether it is a state government or uh, or a central government all agrees that uh, startup uh, startup don't you start up just in a word startup is basically the the idea of uh, experimenting with new ideas with the customers so i see that thing is coming in okay uh, changes are coming uh, hopefully in the education uh, we are reading through all this uh, the, the the national education policy which is just got unveiled and our director of the institute also touched upon that that we need to always change uh, so i i'm sure that we are in the right direction okay uh, that to inculcate inculcate that but more importantly take the responsibility yourself and uh, and try to be you know thoughtful uh, lateral thinking parallel thinking all these words are applicable so whatever you do it try to do it in a different way you will be creative i can bet on that if you try to do it in different way compared to the others you will be recognized as a creative person i have personally experienced it and i can bet on that so that's what would be my uh, in a quick answer mm-hmm. um thank you sir there's a few questions on the ideation versus implementation scenario let me just club a few of them and the idea is between ideation and implementation should there not be a screening process as in a vast majority of actually nice and radical ideas may not be feasible when you look at how you'll go ahead and implement it so should there not be some positive value associated with screening also yeah. as far as india is concerned what do you think we are lacking in are we lacking the ideation or are we lacking the good implementation of an idea okay very good i think there are few components uh, or part of this question let me try to answer all these questions but it's a, a very good uh, question i love it uh, uh, so yes so there there would should there are some what we call stage gate or toll gate you know between ideation to implementation things do not fall uh, naturally so it's like like kind of funnel they say the in, uh, you know the funnel uh, where the top is uh, wide and the bottom is you know that uh, is the yeah. narrow one yeah. so, so so things get funneled as it uh, as as it flows through it so all every idea do not really uh, is taken up for implementation so that's the first part first first part of uh, the answer now question is your second part is that how do i know which are the idea to take and which idea not to take that's the interesting piece and that is where the organizational collective wisdom comes into the effect so in many companies you will see uh, at least uh, in ge i have seen and johnson and johnson two two big companies i worked i have seen that they try to you know in, uh, constitute some kind of internal bodies to scan you know those ideas and try to you know uh, uh, prioritize that these are the things that we should uh, proceed but there is no hard and fast rule i think everybody has to come up with their own criteria mm-hmm. we as a country your third question as a country in india where we lack my personal assessment we have we do not have dots of ideas you go to any forum any place 
you will see plenty of ideas. I think where we lack is the implementation. And that is the in general a challenge or trend in the industry as well. Industry also you know, suffer or basically uh, struggle to implement. Just having an enough idea, a good idea is not enough. Okay, it has to be implemented. So I think from our perspective, maybe we can have a separate talk or uh, there are ways to implement things. Okay, and creativity is coming in the way of implementation as well. Okay, it is, creativity is not just a technology thing. It's not about just an art or, or science. There is an implementation of creativity as well. Okay, that how you can implement things in a smarter way, in an innovative way, so that idea which cannot be implemented in a, in a current uh, 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 setup can be implemented in a new setup. So there are things like, you know, there are live examples uh, uh, that how people built a new uh, new system or new process, manufacturing process, create a, a new tool, both in software development as well as in hardware development, there are uh, creativity as well. For, so implementation is where I think we need to focus on. We are good in ideas. We are good in all soft power, uh, computational power programming, but uh, when it comes to the uh, realize uh, some a soft power into something a tangible outcome or product that can benefit the people, that is where we need to focus on. And we, I, I sure you know, practicing things, uh, we will be, will be able to better in the days mm -hmm. to come. So, thank you. Thanks again. There's one more question that I feel is extremely, I mean, it's an interesting take. So the person is saying, and I feel it's a legitimate point that a lot of manufacturing processes need a set system. For instance, if there's a factory, essentially a construction line, the guy who's screwing a lid on top of a cylinder, if he starts getting creative with his work, things can go a little weird. I mean, if he's supposed to do something in a certain way, he better do it that way, right? So a main, a typical person's job role is more routine and less creativity. So, and the fact is, if if every person starts making creative changes to what they're doing in life, we could have a situation where there is chaos. And how do you think this can be? So essentially, how can creativity be channelized to make it complement the routine that a company needs to follow. Yeah, I think that's a uh, that's an important point. Uh, so certainly, you know, if 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 you are in industry and you have a certain role uh, to play, you cannot throw away that role and uh, you say that oh no, I'm good, not going to do this. I want to uh, start creative things only. I'll sit mm -hmm. idle at one corner. Uh, of my hall or my desk, and I will only do creative things. No, it doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. But having said that, the notion that was just you narrated that person who is putting the screw, he will only put the screw or he will tighten the bolt. Okay, he's, uh, he's, uh, if he stops doing that, he starts doing it, will come to a chaos. That notion is actually changing. Okay, now uh, that's the reason, especially uh, in, in a, uh, in a, like I think we can talk about it. I will talk with my uh, professor. Uh, the industry 4.0, mm -hmm. you know, industry 4.0 that come that I in IIC we have set up the uh, the smart manufacturing factory, common engineering facility, which is uh, where man and the machine are going to work together. That's the future uh, manufacturing plant where humans will not work alone. Uh, where there will be so things are going to behave differently. Mm -hmm. So. Things, what I'm trying to say, and it is my personal uh, take uh, as I've seen things changing, things which are mundane, things which are repetitive, things which does not create our own thought process of creative power, slowly being taken over by automation, by machine. Whereas demand for our own creativity and each of our brains are actually wonderful laboratory to produce ideas, new ideas. So things we are moving where human brains, human power, thought process will be used for to solve problems, not to do a repetitive mundane job like somebody is tightening the board, somebody is you know just putting the lead on the cap on the on the top of a you know, cylinder. Uh, no, that kind of things are going to go away. And it has already gone away in an advanced uh, smart manufacturing things. And there are you know if you look at semiconductor, how much is human touch? Human touch is very very limited mostly done by the machine. 
So things are basically what I'm trying to say is changing and it will change. Uh, and maybe we can have more conversations like uh, we have the smart manufacturing factory in, in IRC, which is the first uh, industry 4.0 uh, uh, in India. In India. Uh, and Germany is a lot ahead of, of us um, in this game. Uh, but we are also trying to, you know, move in that direction. So you can perhaps have more conversation. How the future workplace is going to look like, where man and machine are going to go work together, and what role will be played? Okay, we'll definitely look into Industry 4.0 and trying to have another session on, especially IIC stake on Industry 4.0. Um, now let's just have one last question, and this is uh, I relate with this question personally because. So yes, you've had a lot of experience with AI systems in the past, and the two of us have worked together on the machine learning course by Ambedkar Tukhipati yeah. sir this semester. So I was wondering, and in fact, the questioner is also wondering as to how long is it until machines are going to be truly creative and not just data mining machines? I think it is not going to be so quick. That is for sure. So mm -hmm. that's the reason this artificial intelligence and artificial general intelligence, that is a, uh, we started, started seeing a division. So artificial mm -hmm. general intelligence is a, another concept that has already caught in the imagination of researcher and, and the people in the industry. Where, so in a typical artificial intelligence, although we are saying artificial intelligence, but as you rightly said, it's a, it's a doing the things in a, in a data mining way. So you do not have a human cognizance that uh, or human cognitive power that typically we can sense, we can feel, we can think. Okay, that is part is, uh, is scope is very limited in artificial creative, artificial intelligence. That's the reason artificial general intelligence is coming, where machine can start build think like unto a human. Like we have our own emotions. We feel good. We feel bad. We feel sorrow. We feel happy. Machine cannot have that. But for a creative process, that feeling good, feeling sorrow, feeling happiness is the most important. You, without that, you won't be able to create because creativity. Okay. Uh, people may disagree, or uh, some places you can just by becoming mechanical maybe is uh, good enough. But in my opinion, if you really have to be path breaking, you need to have those moments. And machine will take long time to go. I really do not know how long. But uh, yesterday I was hearing Professor Arindam Ghosh's uh, lecture on uh, quantum computing and etc. So I think he was kind of touched upon that. That maybe with supercomputing power, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, that uh, quantum uh, thing uh, that Google has uh, come up with that uh, quantum supremacy. Maybe with more computative power and more uh, algorithm, we might be able to go in that way. But I believe even if we try to make the machine uh, do it behave it in a human way, meaning they will have their own emotions and feelings. They are actually going to help us. They are mm -hmm. going to aid. Okay, they are going to help us uh, to be a better human, a better creative person. Because ultimately, we are the creator of this machine. So, uh, so yeah, so it will be an interesting journey. I think that way. I also see the my one of my area of research is basically that that how we can harness the power of artificial intelligence. In transforming the design state space, so there is a, if you look at there are some variables within uh, which we try to design things. Now there is a, if you can transform those uh, those that space, you perhaps will be able to get more innovative ideas. So uh, we are trying to explore, going to explore in those directions. Uh, uh, but yeah, I mean it's a journey. I would say it's a journey. I didn't do not know whether it will be achieved in five years, ten years. Uh, but for sure, we will be able to achieve. Uh, uh, Thank you so much. And I really kind of agree with the point that you made. As long as machines don't have the emotional connections that we make to situations and to ideas, it is difficult for them to get to the creative because most of what we perceive as creativity is fueled by emotion to some extent. I mean, that's again just my opinion. Um, okay, true, so. With this, we bring the question answer session to a close. I'd like to thank Kaushik sir on behalf of all of us for having taken time out of his busy schedule to address us. Thank you so much, sir. I'd also like to thank the moderators of this session for handling the questions and making sure we were on track the entire time.
So a lot of effort has gone into arranging these talks, which is largely unseen. Our team has worked tirelessly reaching out to people, putting together the posters, making the website so much more. I can't even list it out. I'd like to take a moment to thank Team Pravega as a whole for handling so much work so well. While I still have you here, I'd like to remind you that our next talk is happening in the afternoon at 4 p.m. where Professor Jyotsna from the Center for High Energy Physics, ISC, will give an overview of the basic principles of particle physics and discuss how a typical particle search experiment is performed at the LHC CERN and her experience in her time there. Be sure to attend. I'd also like to draw your attention to an announcement that has been made in the question answer section with links to our next talk and a short feedback form for us to better understand how we can improve your experience in the coming talks. Thank you so much for tuning in and we'll see you in the next session. Thank you, everyone, guys. Uh, guys, once again, I'm very happy and I would just put one last word from my side. I Definitely think in this, time of, in this time of pandemic, you did not uh, accept the status quo. You, you did not uh, stay idle at home in the confinement of the room uh, in your home or room. Okay, You came up with this idea of Pravega. Of course, it is a collective process, a collective thought, but you all do it, did it in a unique way. So that is actually your creativity. You are not limiting yourself and accepting the status quo, and you are trying to make it better every day. And hopefully, I'll always wish and pray that one day, Pravega, you know, this event will be the best event uh, in this country. Uh, uh, so I just want to add, uh, end by wishing good luck to all of you. Stay safe, stay healthy. Thank you so much, sir.